So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Susie Faria. I am also a second semester senior with LIU Global. And um, this past semester, I spent three months in the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales, Australia, where I was looking at what local organizations are doing to mitigate uh, ghost fishing gear and fishing litter in the region. And so I had the assistance of the lovely Nigel Hayes for that as my advisor, as well as all of the rest of the global staff who were incredibly supportive through this process. So the biggest question I think is what is ghost fishing and what is fishing litter? So ghost fishing is more of the verb um, and fishing litter is more of the noun. So ghost fishing is the process of what happens when fishing litter is uh, left in the ocean. And the fishing litter is basically anything that is used for fishing that is no longer being used for fishing. So that includes line, it includes hooks, lures, nets, crab traps, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that can be um, used for fishing that is no longer in active use. And I'm sorry, I have too many dogs and they keep coming in and out of the room. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's it. And when uh, fishing litter ends up, it, uh, it ghosts fish. It ghost fishes, which essentially means that it does harm and uh, can kill marine life um, in the process of not being cleaned up. Um, and so this is a diagram I found of just the cycle of that. And so what happens is then something will fall in the water. It can attach itself to reefs or what are called benthic zones, which are the bottoms of the ocean. And uh, it entangles those areas. And then it has the opportunity to then entangle other species that are just swimming by. And what happens is something might get caught in it, it dies, it then attracts other species to it. And then it creates this cycle of constantly killing things. And then even if eventually that process stops temporarily, eventually those bodies become so decomposed that then the gear is then able to be released again and the cycle starts all over again, unless it is properly removed through human intervention. So yeah, that's the scale of what we're dealing with here. And what I have found when researching this topic, and I have read many, many things about it, is that recreational fishing in this topic is severely underrepresented. It is never talked about nearly to the scope of commercial fishing, um, which is understandable. Commercial fishing takes a lot more fish out of the water and it is a significant issue in its own right. But recreational fishing, I don't think can be ignored when you're looking at this because we have no global statistics for how many recreational fishermen there are in the world. It's that hard to research. Um, of course, there are fishing... Um, fishing licenses required in a lot of countries and stuff, but in general, it's really hard to research and therefore it hasn't been researched as much. And so why did I choose to study this in the Northern Rivers region? Partially was because my university happened to have connections there and partially because it exposed a lot of things that I didn't realize about the area when I first arrived there last spring in, or their fall, my, like my idea of spring, the Northern Hemisphere spring. There's a huge fishing culture in that region. Um, in Australia in general, it's as, uh, as of a 2003, uh, 2003 study or, um, or census data, there are over 5 million uh, fishermen in Australia alone, which for comparison, they currently have a population of about uh, 25 million. So a fifth of the population is, uh, by those statistics, is doing some form of recreational fishing. That leaves a lot of potential for a lot of fishing litter to end up in the ocean. And uh, this is one region where that, that fishing culture is very much present. And so I, it ended up being really good for this kind of study. Um, yeah. And so my guiding research question here, the one that I, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so how are local organizations in the Northern Rivers region of Australia working to mitigate ghost fishing gear and fishing, recreational fishing litter on coastlines in the ocean to prevent negative environmental impact? And so that guided me throughout this entire three month process. Uh, so here is my lovely stock photo representation of the number of people who are actually talking about this. Uh, yes, there are probably more than three, but you know, the point is that there are 
very, very few people focusing on recreational fishermen when they're talking about this. And so you get massive statistics from the UN, from various UN branches, but these are the ones that focus on recreational fishing. So as for how I went about this research process, I was lucky enough to get in contact with some amazing organizations that are ha working in Australia um, on uh, plastic pollution in general, um, as well as focusing on the fishing gear. So on the farthest left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a neat row of all of the organizations that I was able to contact. So Ozfish, which is this awesome recreational run, like fishermen run organization that was started basically because they believe that fishermen have a responsibility to their environment to keep it healthy and to make sure that future people, uh, fishers are able to fish in those areas. And so they, that's their business model or in the business organization's model um, that guides them through that. There's also Positive Change for Marine Life, which is an anti-single-use plastic organization in, uh, primarily, but they come in later because they do, and even though they're not working specifically on fishing litter, they do come across it in their beach cleanups and such. So they offered me some information. And then the one I was worked closely, uh, most closely with, which is the Australian Seabird Rescue, which is an animal rescue center uh, that focuses primarily on rehabilitating injured and sick seabirds, um, sea turtles, and sea snakes. All of the other uh, organizations that you see on this screen are ones that I may have reached out to, but due to the time constraints and just general scheduling conflicts, I was not never able to talk to them directly, but they are all organizations doing work in this field as well. So, yeah. And so one of the things I did was to collect data was I was an intern at the Australian Seabird Rescue. And uh, in that, through that internship, I was able to get a large variety of field notes as well as meet a couple of the people I ended up interviewing. I interviewed four. One was the head of this branch of the Australian Seabird Rescue. One was uh, a fisherman who actually um, is a volunteer at the Australian Seabird Rescue. And then, uh, yes, of course, Ozfish and um, Positive Change for Marine Life, I also interviewed their representatives. So the Australian Seabird Rescue, uh, as of when I left in November, they, so the Australian uh, fiscal year, financial year, however you say it, uh, starts in July. And according to them, over 40% of the animals that had come into care had experienced some form of injury from fishing gear. That's a significant number of animals. They deal with dozens and dozens of animals throughout the year. And so it's, that's a large percentage. This is mainly seen with seabirds, but it also affected some of the sea turtles as well, um, which you can see if you look at the bottom of the screen, there's that beautiful loggerhead turtle that managed to get itself stuck in a crab pot and then got the line wrapped around its neck and its arm and, or its flipper. And so it, had, it got stuck there and they had to manage to cut it free and rehabilitate it enough so that we could release it again. If you look at the top photo there as well, that's another sea turtle that had um, gotten fishing line wrapped around its flipper so tightly that it caused permanent swelling. So even though they were able to save the flipper, it still has resulted in permanent damage. The same is true for Hans the, the um, pelican, who is also on the bottom part of that screen. He had that beautiful fish-shaped lure stuck in his leg, which has caused his, his foot to kind of permanently be in a curl. So we were able to release him, but we're not sure he'd ever get the full use of his foot back the way he's supposed to, which can inhibit his ability to swim, which is really important for a pelican. Um, you can see all of those various types of injuries that, can, that especially seabirds acquire on the left-hand side. Um, those are all pictures that the, that the Australian Seabird Rescue has taken over the years. And it just does a lot of damage to these poor animals that they were just trying to eat. <laughs> they have no interest in being hooked and that's not the intention of the fishermen either, that they don't wanna catch a bird, they wanna catch fish, that's, it's in the name. And on the farthest right-hand side, you have this bookshelf and in every single one of those jars, there's some form of plastic or metal litter that has been either entangled one of the animals that have come in or they have ingested it and had to pass it. 
it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of pieces of um, litter that, and uh, many of them are related to fishing. They are in lures um, or line. So what did I find in this study? The Beyond the recreational fishing culture, there's just a genuine lack of knowledge um, around this topic, as well as beach cleanups, government intervention not being very effective, and a lot of solutions looking forward. So when you, I already described the fishing culture in Australia right now, but one of the biggest things about it is that there is just such an unawareness that this is something that can result of what they're doing. That like, there's just so many fishermen who are, con who regularly fish, who just like, if you think about it, you're fishing and your hook snags and you can't get it back up, you're just gonna cut the line. Well, problem is if you cut the line, then suddenly that can continue to harm the environment and catch things that are, were never supposed to be caught in the first place. And that's a huge issue is just the lack of knowledge and the lack of awareness surrounding this. Um, beach cleanups were one of the biggest things that I found. I, living in that region, there are regular beach cleanups up and down that coast. Um, and so here are the different organizations that I either interviewed or intended to interview. So we have Positive Change for Marine Life uh, as Fish, the Australian Seabird Rescue, and then a different group called R River Warriors. All of these organizations are basically running beach cleanups in order to try to get as much of the plastic out of the ocean that washes up on their shore as possible and prevent further plastic from entering the ocean. They're doing a lot of amazing work, but unfortunately, it's not stopping it in the way because there's still so much litter happening that like, even though you're cleaning up some of it and doing a great job and that should be supported, you also need to make sure that people aren't littering and the things that they could be littering are not dangerous to the ocean. Um, so yeah, that was a huge theme throughout this whole process. A big issue I found um, talking to my, my recreational fishing friend was um, surrounding the government's idea of what to do about fishing tackle bins, which um, tackle bins, of course, are the things that fishermen take out when they hold all the hooks and everything. But then there's the other side of it where they're collection bins for if you have a piece of tangled line or something, rather than it ending up overboard, you have a specific place to put it so that it doesn't end up in the ocean. Um, the, re the town where the seabird rescue originally was is called Ballina, or is, is called Ballina, and they originally had a bunch of these tackle bins designed for this purpose to contain this, uh, the line along their docks so that when fishermen would come in off of their boats, they'd have an easy place to, duck, uh, to put it. The Ballina City uh, Town Council actually removed those bins recently, and there's only like one of them left, which is just kind of counterintuitive. And um, according to my my lovely fish fisher friend, um, he basically said that if you don't have the bins there, people are just gonna they're not gonna bother basically. And a lot of that um, line, the hooks, the lures, anything is just gonna end up right in the water uh, where the docks are. Ozfish is actually working on a collaboration with the Australian Seabird Rescue to help counter this issue. They are taking up the mantle where the government kind of dropped off and are working to uh, put these bins in place along at popular fishing sites along the coast with the Australian Seabird logo and number. So if you find an injured animal, you can call them, they'll come and help you rescue it. Um, and in the meantime, you're also able to safely dispose of the any, any un um, unusable fishing gear that you might have. Um, they are also currently unable to do this because there's so much bureaucracy that goes into putting these bins in place. Um, so the government, once again, is kind of inhibiting the ability for these organizations to effectively do what they want to, which is unfortunate, but also true uh, of many places in the, which the, the governments are kind of slowing things down. But yeah, so... What does this all mean, essentially? There were a variety of solutions that came out of my talks with people in, uh, in, and in the literature as well as in regards to like the ideas behind biodegradable fishing gear and stuff like that, which 
at this point are probably less likely to happen um, just because it does it, a lot of times it, it uh, loses the line will lose integrity over time because it degrades. And so if you're not fishing regularly, you're not going through enough line to justify having something like that. Um, that's just going to degrade before you get a chance to use it. Um, also plastic, it, it's handy. It's a really handy substance that has caused a whole lot of damage. It's lightweight, it's flexible, it's strong, it's fairly durable. And the, the, uh, the pros of that have, are currently outweighing the cons of it in the eyes of local fishermen. Um, there are other types of waste that can come from this um, too, like in bait bags, which are made out of plastic. And so there's more potential for those to be made out of something biodegradable than the line itself, which of course will help there be less waste in the ocean in general, which is something to be supported, but not, again, it's not dealing with the like issue with the specific fishing gear. Um, yeah, I think the biggest takeaway is just the general lack of knowledge. And this isn't just something that the fishers experience. This is just a general lack of knowledge surrounding this issue. It's grossly understudied and it's not something that has any priority right now. It doesn't, you don't hear about it the way that you hear about the, the issues surrounding single use plastics um, in the ocean. You don't, you just don't. Um, it does not get the same kind of glamour that plastic bags and straws get. And until we can change that, we can't really do anything else, I think, personally, was my biggest takeaway. So yeah, here are some of my references. And are there any questions? Yes. Um, so uh, Susie, and thank you for sharing your, mm -hmm. uh, your contact information, which I hope you and also Osman will put in the chat. Bailey did you could do that again too. Maybe you can um, get off the screen share so we can see the chats and see our our um, our questions. So again, wonderful job there also to all of you uh, presenting today. What um, question? Um, it sounds like the um, if you're moving towards a recommendation at all, it sounds like raising awareness and getting the word out and getting educative efforts. Um, that seems to be a real priority. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Uh, in yeah. The, in that? Um, yeah, I mean, like, like I said, the, the focus has been on commercial gear in mm -hmm. most ways. Um, and so the recreational side of things just is not talked about at all. And I, I understand why, because recreational fishing is just significantly harder to monitor. Mm -hmm. um, you're dealing with tons and tons of individuals who are not going out on licensed boats. There's no paper trail for a recreational fisher other than having a fishing license. And even that is kind of wishy-washy sometimes. Like you don't not uh, like, and because there's a limited supply of like people who are monitoring these people, like they're not going around regularly checking to see who has fishing licenses and who doesn't. And when they are, they tend to do it in places like the Great Barrier Marine Park. Mm -hmm. Reef Marine Park, which is a protected region rather than just places where you're already allowed to fish. Um, so yeah, there's just a general like lack of acknowledgement of it as an issue, even though there's a, a big culture around fishing. And I think that that's kind of the biggest thing standing in the way right now of this being recognized. Yeah, so it sounds like discourse shift and education. We've got another couple of questions coming in in the chat, Susie. Incredible job, Susie. I am so impressed with your wealth of knowledge. Could you reiterate the scale of this problem, like the percentage of fishing gear in the ocean as compared to the scale of how many people are not talking about this issue? So how much junk are we looking at in the ocean there that's yeah. related to fishing gear? So it's really hard to monitor. Like there's nobody, anybody who tells you they know what type of plastic is the worst in the ocean doesn't actually know because there's no actual way to gather all of the pl plastic that is in the ocean and then sort it and figure out what is the worst cause of it. That being said, there are um, like fishing gear specifically tends to uh, exist uh, like really heavily along coastlines, partially due to recreational fishing. Um, and then there are estimates of specifically the uh, Great Barrier, or not the Great Barrier Marine Park, the Pacific, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, um, which has gained a whole lot of fame. Um, 
Nets fishing line and just fishing gear in general is estimated to make up about 46% of that garbage patch. And then uh, it's estimated to be 52% of mega plastics, which are plastics that are over two inches long um, or five centimeters. So if you like hold up your thumb there, it's anything large, like your, the size of your thumb and larger. And fishing gear is estimated to make up 52% of the mega plastics in that specific garbage patch. So this is like a, a big thing. And also the thing about like, if you're looking at how a garbage patch forms uh, in, a, in a gyre, like you're looking at things that are gonna hold it together and nets do a really good job at holding things together like that. So of course it's like collecting things and making and like bringing it all together into this, this um, into the gyre and just making it a lot more visible. Well, we have time for one more question. So uh, that's, I hadn't thought of that. That's horrible. <laughs> um, great job, Susie. You mentioned they're working to create biodegradable nets, but have you seen the efforts to repurpose the plastic in the nets that are no longer viable so they don't end up in the landfill? Yeah. So there's actually a pretty, um, there's a couple of organizations that I'm I kind of nerd out about a little bit, which uh, one of them is called ghost fishing, which are there a bunch of scuba divers who go and they collect the nets off of like the floors and like any ones that are kind of connected to something and they'll, um, they'll collect them. And then what they do is they send it to a different organization that actually recycles the plastic and turns them into swimsuits, which is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can actually shop there. I will see if I can get the link to that organization and send it through the chat because it's actually pretty cool. Um, and we love, we love uh, organizations that work with these kinds of problems and, and, turn them into something cute, you know. <laughs> um, and then from Allison, are you going to be going into this work? <laughs> that is yet to be decided. Um, I would love to, I'm currently not a scuba diver, but I would love to become one. And if I were able to do that, I would love to work for Ghost Diving, which is the organization that, um, it's, it's their volunteer scuba divers mostly. And so they just go down and collect them. And I think that would be a really cool thing to do. Um, I am looking at, uh, potentially figuring out how to make the fact like ghost, like fishing gear specifically a bigger, um, issue at the UN level and having it actually be an annex in Marpol. Mm -hmm. Um, that was the basis for my thesis and we'll see if that goes anywhere in my future. I might, if I continue with this topic, then I might try to turn that more into a master's um, than my undergrad, but only time will tell at this point. I'm not ignoring the issue after this. Like I'm still pretty attached to it. So we'll see. Okay. Thank you again. And thank you. Big round for all of our um, session uh, two folk. So thank you ever so much. Hello. Thank you so much, everybody who's been presenting before me. You're doing so well. Um, I'm Serena Brenhofer. Um, today I'm going to be talking about how New York women cope with pleasure inequity, um, which was the subject of my case study last semester, fall 2019, um, which I conducted in conjunction with LAU Global, as you can see. Joss was my advisor. Um, so just a little bit of um, background information, why this is such an important issue. Um, only 11% of women report orgasming in their first hookup with a new person, um, and 50% of women report enjoying their sexual activity very much. So that's not a very um, encouraging number <laughs> for either of those. Um, and orgasm inequity is basically the terminology that we decided to use um, to describe the pleasure gap or the orgasm gap as a whole. And that's going to be illustrated more clearly going forward. So how, if that's how women are experiencing sex, how are women and the men that they're having sex with experiencing it differently? Um, in this situation, 75% um, of heterosexual men always orgasm, while 33% of heterosexual women always orgasm. That's um, a pretty stark contrast. And 95% of heterosexual men usually always orgasm, and 65% of heterosexual women usually always orgasm. So there's a clear disparity between these two um, groups of people, basically. Um, 
And if we were to break it down in order of who gets to orgasm most often and who is most likely to, straight men are the most likely and straight women are the least likely um, out of an entire survey of thousands of people. So then that brings me to the question, uh, clearly it's an issue, clearly it's something that a lot of young women everybody has to deal with, um, but how are we coping with it? Um, and this question was brought up most clearly for me when I started having conversations with my classmates, with my friends, with my peers about their sexual experiences and what that was like for them. Um, I started hearing repeating narratives of folks saying that they just didn't feel like their sexual experience was something that their partner cared about. Like, he came and then he left, you know? Um, and that's a pretty popular, unfortunately, narrative that gets shared because it is so, as I said, such a common issue. Um, and so my research question was, how do young women cope with orgasm inequity? I was getting the receiving end of a lot of folks' experiences, but that was only one way that they were talking about it and with one person. Um, and with the necessity for this research, um, doing it in New York, I basically focused in on how do young women in the greater New York metropolitan area um, cope with orgasm inequity in their heterosexual sex um, with men. So that's one of my limitations. Um, and I have a bunch of methods. So basically the way I was coming at it is with obviously a sex positive feminist lens, um, as well as standpoint feminism. Um, which basically is allowing you to show the specific ways that um, you experience your life um, as a woman, as a man, as somebody who doesn't identify as either or both. Um, and with that, basically bringing in together an intersectional approach. Um, and what developed over time throughout the case study was a necessity to have an emphasis on human rights. Um, We'll talk about that a little later on, but the ways that I did my research were um, intense bibliographic research. I've read a lot <laughs> um, and thematically coded seven semi-structured interviews. Um, I worked with seven women basically um, and took part in focus groups. Um, most of them were LIU students, um, five of the seven. Um, the other two were sourced outside. Um, it was really important that we have an emphasis on consent and well-being because it is such a sensitive issue. Talking about sex with a stranger or even a friend can sometimes be really, really difficult. Um, so having a lot of sensitivity was necessary, as well as setting the terms. So making clear that when we're talking, we're, we're looking mostly entirely for consensual experiences, not necessarily for other harder things. Um, I will be talking a little bit about sexual assault later on, just so you all know. Um, but setting those terms was an absolute necessity, as well as deciding who was going to be part of the study. Um, the only requirement was that you identified as a woman or femme, um, and that you had had some kind of unsatisfactory sexual experience with a man. That was it. <laughs> so... As we continued talking, as we had interviews, as we met, um, which mostly took place in November, um, three main facets of, of coping began to emerge. Um, and I grouped them here into solitary, representative, and social. Um, these main themes ended up being um, pretty indicative of how everybody coped. <laughs> um, so firstly, um, on the solitary aspect um, was journaling, some masturbation, um, and meditation. So self-reflection um, on a self-to-self -self scale, not really bringing anything or anyone else into it, um, just you and maybe a vibrator, I don't know. Um, and as far as reflective goes, um, seeing yourself represented and your stories and your experiences can be an incredibly powerful thing. We've seen this um, across every field. Um, but one of the most important ways that uh, my participants were coping was with humor. <laughs> um, watching stand-up specials, 
cracking jokes about it, even in the interviews, like being incredibly funny. Um, <laughs> and that was reflected. So another way was through popular media portrayal. So looking for stories that match theirs in TV or movies or music um, was really revolutionary for a lot of folks because as we know, sex is pretty commonly a taboo in um, US culture, um, specifically in New York as well, anywhere. Um, so seeing that story of, of being unsatisfied, um, feeling like your orgasm, your pleasure didn't matter, um, seeing that with actors um, can be incredibly powerful. As well, looking for um, more femme and women-centered um, pornography as well, um, which kind of goes hand in hand with the masturbation, but just like seeing um, women's pleasure be prioritized in pornography can be incredible as well. Um, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, but what I found was fascinating um, was the social aspect. Um, folks who chose to cope socially, um, specifically by venting with friends, by having just one-on-one -on -one conversations, even bringing family into it, making jokes, playing Cards Against Humanity, I don't know, whatever. Um, and communication with partners also became um, increasingly clear um, as one might expect. <laughs> Um, and that was always hinging on the aspect of safety um, and how long-term that relationship was. Um, once more, therapy, always important, always incredible. If you know me at all, you know I'm a big proponent, love therapy. Um, but to circle back with communication with partners, what I began to notice was that there was a spectrum of, of comfort in being able to talk with partners as well as with friends. This wasn't just a one-on-one -on -one situation. It was as well bringing in group chats and however you most closely communicate with your friends, Zoom presentations. Um, so on that spectrum was the length of the time that they had been seeing a partner. Um, hookups, one night stands, folks who weren't planning to see each other again, very often were brought into a group chat conversation um, in the venting um, because it was easier. There was going to be less of a, a pressure of, I need to keep this information safe. I need to make sure that um, I don't make my partner look bad. Um, it was a one night stand. You can crack jokes with your friends and be done. Um, and as the partnerships began um, through the interviews becoming longer and longer, um, seeing people multiple times, there's way more openness with communication with those partners than with a one night stand. Um, and even in long term relationships, there is a certain amount of openness that can be afforded um, that you probably wouldn't with a stranger. Um, so these findings were pretty um, self explanatory, I suppose, but. Um, Along with that was the conversation of consent. Venting with friends most often happens when something, when it goes wrong, but it's not necessarily um, dangerous or particularly painful for you to bring up. That's going to be more in a one-on-one -on -one situation um, than with a group chat. Um, and when the women started to discuss times that they felt uncomfortable with their partners or one of my participants um, said that she really didn't enjoy one night stands anymore because every time she went into it with a mentality that it wasn't safe. Um, that if she told him something about how it was for her, that it wasn't a good experience, that he needed to move a little bit somewhere else, that he needed to find the clit, I don't know. Um, that brought up anxiety and a lot of fear. Um, and she wasn't alone in that. Um, almost every single one of my participants, I think six out of the seven, um, brought up the issue of consent at some point. Um, and this is where we bring in the discussion where consent is important <laughs> always, every single time. Um, and coercion also matters. Um, and feeling coerced to have sex that isn't satisfying. Um, and then coerced to not say anything about it to partners is 
a part of that social um, conditioning um, that we all receive. It's not necessarily an intentional thing by partners every single time. It's something that we absorb socially. Um, so what I'm now working on with the thesis that we were doing um, is that sexual dissatisfaction does exist on a spectrum of violence. Um, and this is incredibly clear to me um, based on the experiences that the women shared their stories, how there is always the possibility of danger and fear in every single situation. Um, and bringing that up um, puts you more at risk. Um, and so then that brings us to, if it's on the spectrum with sexual violence, then how are we responding as a society? Um, and here I've got some illustrations from the United Nations, engaging in sexual behaviors should feel pleasurable. Um, and the World Health Organization, sexual health requires the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences. Um, so this posits that sexual pleasure isn't um, something that's frivolous or shouldn't be considered or that women's experiences don't matter when it comes to sexual displeasure um, because sexual pleasure is a human right. There is no way for us to look each other in the face and say that 11% of women are experiencing the satisfaction that they need the first time with a new partner and that that is just. Uh, sexual pleasure is a human right, as you can clearly see illustrated on your screens. And it's really important that we start discussing it that way. Um, saying that, oh, that's how men are, or that's how this relationship goes, you know how it goes. That isn't an excuse anymore, and it never was. Um, and there are international organizations backing me up on that. Um, but unfortunately, it's not um, part of the mainstream discourse. We're much more concerned with larger health crises, um, like the spread of STIs um, and unwanted pregnancies. Um, but that doesn't make this an unimportant discussion. And I think it's something that I'll be more than happy to continue <laughs> with all of you in the question section. Um, but just want to nail that in, uh, that this is really important and you need to be having these discussions with the people that you love and care about. And comprehensive sexual education is incredibly important to get this information to the people who are just starting to have sex and who already have been. These are my key references, as well as the ones I used here. And now for questions. You can reach me at this email. I'm going to put it in the chat too, though. <laughs> Thank you. Sabina. Woot. Wow. So while people are putting up questions in the chat uh, for Serena to, uh, to answer, and uh, she's putting up her, um, her email so you can continue the dialogue uh, offline. Um, I know you've, uh, you've, this was very um, provocative in, in, uh, in, in the way that I mean about bringing in the human rights aspect of it and the implications of your, of your uh, wonderful claims. So um, I wanted to, to really um, ask you, you look, you're looking in the UN, UN context, I mean the US context, but this really is a global issue that there's a pleasure gap and that, and that you see that in the spectrum of what, what, so what's the extent of that uh, going on like, you know, kind of beyond um, the, the, the region that you studied, the greater New York um, uh, area, specifically for your qualitative research and then the US yeah. for, uh, for your uh, case study context? Yeah, um, so the US isn't a vacuum. Um, if it's happening here, it's happening everywhere. We can make that assumption because it just seems kind of obvious to, to me, at least having read the literature, having been a woman, having been friends with women, knowing that sex is such a taboo, um, even more so in other parts of the world, um, definitely more pervasive than we want to say it is. Just an example, genital cutting um, with the removal of part or the entire clitoris. Um, I want to say something 60 to 70 percent of folks with clitorises um, need that kind of stimulation um, to have an orgasm. Um, penetration, well and good. 
Um, but only 20 to 30 percent of folks um, can orgasm with that alone. Um, and so if genital cutting is happening, then clitorises are getting cut off and you need it. <laughs> I'm yes, laughing I'm serious, I promise. <laughs> Yes, and we have some wonderful questions popping up. Uh, here's from Caitlin um, Epstein. Um, were there differences between women of color and white women? And if so, how can this be addressed? I don't think you talked to us about your sample and about your bibliographic research, which also uh, explored, um, you know, explored diverse uh, uh, experiences around pleasure. Um, yeah, so I had three women of color out of my seven. Um, um, and I would say that we stayed mostly on the questions that I was using, um, but they were definitely bringing in perspectives that some of my other participants weren't, um, so much considering. Um, I noticed that one of my participants, um, she was the one who felt the most unsafe in every sexual situation with a stranger, with someone that she knew. Um, and that was based off of past experiences, of course, because we're made of our lived experience. Um, but there was more hesitation to identify um, some, of the, some of the ways that maybe relationships have been unhappy or difficult sexually. Um, and definitely more of a focus on fear. Does that answer your question? Yes, it it it, it does. And I think as you're continuing to explore um, sexual pleasure and the link to empowerment, that that's that's really uh, can there are devastating implications that are implied there. And you also confirm that in the literature. Here's another uh, great question, uh, which goes to I think. Um, some other important issues. What have you found in terms of the presence of addressing sexual pleasure in high school sex ed classes? Great question. Who asked that? Who did this? Ana, Ana Mendez. Oh my gosh, great. Love these. You guys are killing it. Um, so last semester I was actually um, facilitating workshops on comprehensive sexual education. That was my internship. Um, got real comfortable. Um, and I would say high schools are severely lacking. Um, this is, this shouldn't come as news, but, um, the discussion of pleasure really isn't a part of high school sexual education. Thinking about mine, um, we were mostly focused on STIs, how not to get them, how not to get pregnant. Um, when that's the major concern, it's really hard to instill trust with folks who are trying to learn. Um, when you're constantly telling them don't have sex, like don't do this you're going to get pregnant and then you'll die like mean girls. It's, it's real. People are doing that. Um, thankfully the high schools that I was working in, um, obviously were a little bit chiller <laughs> and mm -hmm. I was teaching. <laughs> so it was pretty pleasure focused, pretty self-care oriented, but high schools are sorely lacking in pleasure oriented, um, sex ed. And that's why it's so important that we talk about it because there are organizations, there's actually um, on a federal level for um, sex ed in schools. Uh, there's an organization that I can email you. Can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but um, there is work being done. There are advocacy groups that want it, um, but local, state, federal government make it real hard. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you're really uh, advocate. You've, you've identified the problem. You have. Uh, you're arguing for a shift in the dis discourse, consciousness raising, and lots of changes. How are you going to? Uh, we don't have time for all the excellent questions here, but here's the question: How are you going to carry this research forward and, and continue to make change in the world? Um, once this quarantine is over, um, <laughs> there's lots to do. Um, mm -hmm. Ideally, working somewhere in sex education advocacy, um, just so people know how important it is. Um, and in the short term, I do work at the Museum of Sex. That is, uh, I'm currently unemployed, as many people are, but technically do still um, have some 
loyalties hanging out. Um, and there it's really fun. Uh, I sell sex toys. That's my job. I educate people on what they do and give them information if they want it on how to use them and how their bodies might work. Everybody's different, but you can offer information. Um, and I think that's the most important thing is just keeping talking about it. It's really uncomfortable for a lot of people, but we gotta, we gotta turn that over. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much again. Um, clap, clap. Mm-hmm.